I know some of you have heard this before, but all models are wrong and some are useful. You have to determine whether, so like you can spit that, you can make up values, you can have the software spit this out. The question becomes, is it actually doing what we think it's doing? Is it actually modeling something that has to do with bee abundance, bee species richness, or pollen deposition? So this was the seminal paper that, that did this, and so they actually went out in three different um, places and they looked for those data. And well, they ca gathered, captured, ca um, how do you say, collected, collected those data. So in this um, column, you have the data for California, the maps I was showing you, the Yolo County. Here you have data from Costa Rica, um, and here you have data from New Jersey and Pennsylvania. These two were highly agricultural landscape. This one was kind of a mixed landscape. Um, all of these were done at, um, I'm almost sure it was 30 meters spatial resolution. On the x-axis, you have that pollination service score, what the output of the model was. On the y-axis, on the top row, you have pollinator abundance. On the middle row, you have species richness. And, and on the last row, you have pollen deposition. And do not ask me how they measure that, okay? I'm the geographer in the room. Um, but I'm sure it's in the paper somewhere. Uh, and so basically, you know, in at least in two of the landscapes, and I, I know in the back you can't see it, but they're getting fits um, between the output of the model and abundance, richness, and even pollen deposition that are pretty good, right? The R squares are 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, uh, 0.6. This is a bit lower, 0.2, and it's not statistically significant. Um, in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania site, they didn't get as good results, and they discussed why in the paper. They think um, they just didn't capture the heterogeneity of that landscape as well. Um, but overall, in those agricultural landscapes, it worked pretty well. Now, I've been doing work with Eric, Dr. Lonsdorf, um, to do the same thing, but in the prairie pothole region. Remember this morning when I told you that there's lots of gra grassland removal in the western part of the corn and soybean belt in the U.S.? And that's an area that's really important because the, the 40 to 60 percent of all honey beehives in the U.S. go there to, um, to uh, over summer. Um, after they're done pollinating, you know, stuff in Florida and almonds in California, they're all trucked. Uh, so 40 to 60 percent of all hives in all in the entire conterminous U.S. are brought back to this area. And so it just so happened that the United States Geological Survey um, had contact with a commercial beekeeper who had the location of all of his hives in um, these counties in North, so this is Canada, this is North Dakota, here are the counties in question. Um, but he had these all these hives, and for each hive, he had um, data on honey production, and he kept pretty careful records, although slightly messy, um, as you'll see in a second. Um, and I was like, okay, well, this is a great um, data set to test this model for honeybees. Now, we had to adjust it a little. Basically, we just had to be like, forget about nesting. We just want to do something on floral resources. We did have great land cover. Um, this is from Cropscape data. Um, it's, it's produced every year um, for, our, for the United States um, and it does really well at identifying through um, class, um, um, classification uh, procedures. At it, as a, it does really well at identifying corn, soybeans, and then these developed open water um, other stuff, like I've collapsed a lot of things under other um, because it, it's got lots of crops that it doesn't, it can't really tell apart. So there's no point in keeping them separate. Um, so, but basically we had land cover map, which was needed. We had it at multiple time steps, which was needed because we had multiple time periods where um, this beekeeper um, was willing and could find his records. Um, 
what what we did know is most of us had never been to this region um, myself included and we didn't really know how to rank these uh, land covers in terms of their suitability like in terms of how um, well the land covers provided floral resources and so what we did is we did a survey of experts in the region that do you know the, so they're entomologists that run around this area and they have a really good understanding of where you might find bees like where bees like to forage in this landscape and so we sent them a survey and we asked them okay these are all the land covers in our um, land use land cover map and for spring, summer, and fall, can you rank how suitable that land cover is at providing floral resources? So you'll notice that in spring and fall, corn provides, would, would be expected to provide zero floral resources for a bee. Um, and it would be, be a, like a semi-poor uh, provis provisioner of um, floral resources in the summer. Um, you know, Alpha Alpha um, is a really good provider of floral resources in um, the summer and then some in the spring and, and, um, and fall. And so we had multiple experts go through this and then we calculated the mean of their um, answers and the mean was weighted, we also asked them how sure are you of your answer and, and it was weighted by um, their, um, their confidence in their answer. And so that's what got applied across this landscape. And again, we're just, it's, it's called the floral resource index here because we're not using nests since the bees are in boxes that the beekeeper places on this landscape at apiaries. Um, so what we did is we used the model that just had the floral resource index and aggregated it you know, with, through that distance weighted and, and, and honeybees can fly five, 10 kilometers, okay? Um, and so we, we applied that over the landscape of um, North Dakota and you see the range here, so lighter colors, you don't have um, this ecosystem, we don't think there is the ecosystem service of pollination, and greener color, dark green, yes, we think that there is um, this ecosystem of, of pollination. And remember, we did this for 2008, 2009, um, 2010, the beekeeper lost his 11 records, and then 2012. Um, and so we can also look at the difference over time in this landscape of um, the foraging resource index. Um, and redder colors mean a loss of the, um, of the you know, like less of that index, and then blue is, is more. Um, these are um, American Indian, Native American um, reservations. And that's why they kind of had, they don't have a, um, apiaries on them, or sometimes. Um, and there's also um, US federal land, grasslands and stuff. This is what the validation data looked like. It was a bunch of rolls in this man's um, barn. Um, and then he would keep track of where he had placed his um, apiary and then if he had moved it, and then how many supers, how many um, trays of honey he was collecting. And that all had to be um, digitized, you know, made digital so that we could analyze it. Um, so the first step, what we did, is we calculated this, pseudo, this floral resource index um, for different um, foraging ranges, just, and then we, we compared that to the validation data and we picked um, the, the, the foraging range that, that, best, um, th that provided the best fit with the validation data. And that was, um, I think it was a five kilometer uh, foraging range. So it looked like, um, based on these data, that the honeybees in this area were going uh, up to, you know, and obviously this is a mean, um, five kilometers and then coming back. And then the next step was um, we had to fit, it's called a repeated measures model because you can't just put all of these data in one regression because you have 
data at one apiary for four years. So your data aren't independent. So you have to build a structure in the model that tells it, uh, uh, you know, this apiary is rep represented four times. And sometimes it's just represented three times. Like one year, you know, he decides not to put the apiary. But you're just telling the model that there's this structure in there. And then you look at um, the fit between this model output, the forage resource index here on the x-axis, and then in, on the y-axis here we had the honey yield at each um, at each um, apiary, and the different colors are the different years. And notice that in 2008, 9, and 10, we do pretty good with the model. 2008 is the best year. In 2012, everything. Um, Let's be polite. It uh, falls apart. Yes, that, that would be the way. Um, and this is just, it, it was a weird year. Like if you look at the, our, our agricultural reports in the U.S., um, it was just a weird, there was weird temperature and precipitation patterns. Um, the bees got affected with more mites than usual. And you can see, you know, they, like, even though, so like in 2008, he put out um, no, and this is all in North Dakota. So 400,000 colonies, and you could get like 90 pounds of honey per colony. In uh, 2012, they only got 70 pounds. That's a tremendous decrease. There were just other factors beyond landscape, which, you know, I showed you. Bees are being bombarded with different stressors. And it just so happened that that kind of, we think, just drowned the land cover signal. It just didn't matter where you put them. Uh, there's other things going on, but for these other um, these other length um, years, uh, we did pretty good. And sure enough, if you map, so this is the the three the couple counties um, that we're looking at, and these are the 2008, 2009, and 2010 data. Um, the purple outlines are hives. Well, it's a it's a five kilometer radius, or it might be. 2.5, but five kilometer radius around each one of this guy's apiaries. And if you, um, and on, in purple are the ones that have uh, one standard deviation lower honey production than the mean of all of his hives. The grays are, are, you know, within that range. And then the black are one standard deviation above. So they're producing more honey than the average of all of his eyes. And you can kind of see that there is quite a bit of concentration um, of these lesser performing hives in that area of the U.S. that is in, that is, uh, in the, the area of North Dakota that is experiencing that encroaching of grassland. So the, it looks like those land use land cover changes of going from grassland to corn and soybeans is affecting honey production at a state level um, when, and really most of the honey in the U.S. is coming from there. So it's, it's, it's a national um, implication to that. So um, that's all I have, and we're going to um, try it out on a land cover um, for the city of Chicago. Um, and you'll see some of the pitfalls of trying to look at this in a city. But um, questions before we move to the module? What if we were to give you a one-year sabbatical? I'll take it. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> in the sub-Saharan African country of your choice. And your job is for a state, a region, or a whole country, depending on where you choose, implement kind of as rigorous an analog of this as you could. How would I do that? Well, what would be the pieces of the puzzle? Because I bet a lot of people, I mean, you just showed us some really sophisticated examples. They're neat. And sometimes it can be hard to say, well, how do I do that where I live? And so I'm just, you know, kind of imagine you're here. So the first step would be to talk to bee biologists or entomologists. Is the right? Usually bee biologists. Bee biologists, okay. So the first step would be to talk to bee biologists and kind of ask them, in your experience, in these landscapes, where do, bee, where do you see bees? Where do you not see bees? The second step would, and you would talk to multiple bee experts, right? The second step would be, well, are there any land use land cover maps, uh, d d data sets out there 
that match what those bee biologists told me? Like, is it enough to just use the Anderson level one classification and just have agriculture versus um, forest versus grassland in this landscape? Can, is there enough of a differentiation there with the bee species that are here that um, those land covers will matter to where you find bees in this landscape? If the answer is no, then you have to make your own land use land cover classification um, and, and accurately enough map those land covers. Worst case, you have to digitize them. So you have to look at, you know, or collect GPS points and, and, and do all sorts of other analyses. But you need a land use land cover map that you um, that is accurate enough to, to represent the different land cover classes that bees in this area would visit or not visit. If, um, so once you have that, and maybe you're lucky and the, you know, the, the ready-made can products work for you, um, the, once you have that, you just um, plug it in the model, right? You go back to the experts and you say, okay, here are my um, here are my land use land covers. How much um, do they provide in terms of nesting resources? You know, relative amounts. How much do they provide in terms of nesting resources? Relative amounts. What kind of gills do I need? Do I need multiple seasons? Like here it might be wet and dry season, but for all I know in the wet seasons, bee don't fly around here. Like I don't know. Like again, that's where consulting that bee biologist is really important. Um, and then you would model this. And meanwhile, you would task the bee biologist with going to um, all of these different land covers and capturing your validation data. So using sweep nets and bee bowls, you would get uh, in field, you know, in the field, um, count of bee abundance and species richness, and maybe even pollen deposition. And so you would have that validation data that you could then check your model outputs against. And if you got good results, then you could probably apply this to broad areas in um, the region. Assuming, you know, the biogeography doesn't change completely. So, yes? So, I'm, I'm looking at what you showed us. It feels to me that what you're assembling kind of on the raster side is a lot like the outputs that we get from ecological niche models. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there are some recent, which is to say it's a suitability surface, mm -hmm. right? And there is some recent work that is at least suggestive of turning those suitability surfaces into maps of potential abundance. And so I'm wondering if the niche model were at sufficiently fine scale, could one not essentially just accumulate occurrence data for the bees and relate that to remotely sensed data to, cre to create the suitability or potential abundance surface and then use that as an input into these models instead of the you know, what, what you're assembling from, from expert knowledge. So let me, let me repeat to see if I got it. So you're, you're doing, you're creating a um, ecological niche model for any and all species in the area. It would be for each species in the Each region. species in the, yes. And then you're adding them to get an idea of the species richness. Right. And that could be weighted by the importance. Right. How, how often, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you... Then what? Well, then, I mean, I'm saying, or I'm asking if we couldn't just plug... That could be a validation model. as well. It could be a validation, or it could you be... It could be an input into the model, yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking if the, the place you choose for your sabbatical is kind of devoid of, of you know, 
detailed quantitative B knowledge, mm -hmm. could you could one essentially create it based on where the bees are yes. and where the bees aren't? Yeah, I mean, and that that'd be totally yeah, that'd be fair. I think it would be a good approach. Actually, you'd have a measure of the diversity, uh, an estimate of the diversity of bees in the area. Um, and then you could look at the, um, how much floral resources are in the, in the area and kind of merge those two um, to give you an idea of where you might find more or less bees. And you could do it for nesting and, um, and floral resources. It'd be neat. It's a project. 